On the first day, Major General Stonewall Jackson attacked and was repulsed. Today, it's Major General John Pope's turn to attack. Longstreet is marching to Jackson's aid with 25,000 men. His march begins at 6 a.m. and is anticipated in a handful of hours. Stonewall just needs to wait till then. He has 20,000 men to hold with. Deploying on a stony ridge, his line goes Jackson's division, which is on the Union's left, Major General Richard S. Ewell's division in the center, and Major General Ambrose P. Hill's division on the right. Aside from just the elevated hill, Jackson also has an unfinished rail line for added defense. But the force on Stony Ridge hinders his artillery. Jackson also has men to wait for and assist Longstreet when he arrives. Major General John Pope rides into Centerville. He warns that his forces are too far south. He has made numerous maneuvering mistakes. Major General Irvin McDowell is nowhere to be found? Will this be the second defeat at Bull Run by McDowell? God damn McDowell! He's never where he's supposed to be. Rear General John Gibbon, after talking to Pope, rides down to Manassas Junction, finds Major General Fitz Porter, Major General Irvin McDowell, and Major General Rufus King. Pope stricks McDowell divisions, having one attached to Porter, one attached to Major General Fran Sigil, and one left to McDowell which is currently far away, leaving the third car with zero forces present for battle. Pope comes up with a complex plan of battle. Porter's command is to move towards Gainesville and attack the right, Sigil to attack the left when light shine. Major General Fran Sigil has an abundance of forces under his command. Three divisions, led by Major General Robert C. Schneck, Adolf von Steinwe, and Karl Schutz. Along with independent brigades, one of infantry under Major General Robert H. Milroy, and one of cavalry under Colonel John Beardsley, and one of artillery under Captain Lewis Schrimmer, and Virginal John F. Reynolds' division of McDowell's Corps. The problem is Sigil doesn't know exactly where Jackson's forces are, so instead of striking the flank, at 7 a.m., Virginal Schutz's brigade comes into contact with Jackson. Colonel Alexander Smith will go and Colonel Kuznowski form up against the edge of a forest and get ready to skirmish. They engage with Virginal Maxi Gregg and Virginal Isaac Trumbull's brigades, even going into hand-to-hand -hand combat. Shirt sends word to Sigil that Jackson is here and not bad. And reinforcements are needed. The first to respond is Virginal Milroy, who sends in his brigades of Ohioans and West Virginians. Milroy's brigade is immediately hit with musket volleys, causing great confusion. <laughs> The 82nd Ohio actually gets behind trouble, but the Confederates are soon reinforced and force the Buckeyes to retreat. In fact, all of Miller's brigade is forced back. The brigades of Schneck and Reynolds engage in artillery duels. But don't go into battle themselves. Sigil's corps has been stopped, and then Virgil George Meade's brigade comes in from Reynolds' division. He starts medical evacuations. Miller starts to rally his men, then spots Virginal Julius Stahl's brigade and tell them to attack. As Milroy sees Stahl, Confederates come charging out of the woods. <laughs> Stahl drives them back, but doesn't advance. The bleeding has stopped, but the Union has made no gains. Schutz believes he's about to receive the support of Major General Philip Kearney's division. The assault begins again. <laughs> Fine goes to a brutal stalemate until Major General APO is reinforced. Schurz's men are forced backwards, and the Confederates are sent back by artillery fire. Kearney has some support and instead goes to the other side of Bull Run Creek, with his three brigades, and threatens Jackson's supply lines. Stonewall instantly sends his cavalry and horse artillery to the fort. Colonel Fitzgerald Lee with the 1st Virginia to stop Kearney. Kearney doesn't need stopping because he doesn't realize he has found the Confederate rear advances no further. Kearney moves back behind the creek and lets the artillery do their work. And the artillery has been doing well. Jackson, eager for the assault, has been watching costly counterattacks that have been decimated by the Union's heavy guns. But these costly counterattacks have dissuaded the Federals from assaulting themselves. Major General Francis is proud with the battle he has been holding so far. By now, it's midday, and Pope has reached the battlefield, and he is angry. The attacks against Jackson have been a failure. He has men rushed to join up with Sigil to carry on the assault. 
Major General Joseph Hooker's division from the 3rd Corps Army of the Potomac and a brigade under Virginal Isaac Stevens from the 9th Corps go away. Pope knows he has reinforcements on the way to the 3rd and 9th Corps and the rest of McDowell's Corps. But is it enough? Longstreet's men start arriving on Pope's left flank. Maybe he could cut his losses and withdraw. Could the Union survive another retreat? Could the army itself? Major General John Pope isn't going to let the Union lose at Bull Run a second time and decides a frontal assault. Reinforcements are just a second away. Stonewall's forces must have begun cracking under this pressure. Right? Wall Street's men form up on the turnpike with the divisions of Bird General John Bell Hood, Bird General James Kemper, Bird General David Jones, and Bird General Camdus Wilcox. Major General Fitz Porter and Major General Urban McDowell marching down the Manassas are marching down the Manassas Gainesville Road. A group of cavalry open fire. These are men of Major General Jeb Stewart's cavalry. They aren't much, but they are enough to stop the column. And then a confusing order arrives. Generals McDowell and Porter, you will please move forward with your joint commands towards Gainesville. I send General Porter written orders to that effect an hour and a half ago. Hanselman, Sigil, and Reno are moving on the War Renton Turnpike and must not be far from Gainesville. I desire that as soon as communication is established between this force and your own, the whole command shall halt. It may be necessary to fall back behind Bull Run at Centerville tonight. I presume it will be so on account of our supplies. If any considerable advantages are to be gained by departing from this order, it will be not strictly carried out. One thing must be had in view, that the troops must occupy a position from which they can reach Bull Run tonight, or by morning. The indications are that the whole force of the enemy is moving in this direction, at a pace that will Bring them here by tomorrow night, or the next day. My own headquarters will be for the present with Heinzelman's Corps, or at this place. Porter and McDowell don't know what to do. What the order is trying to say is, attack. But I'm with the two corps commanders on this one. The column again stops when they see giant clouds of dirt. It's a lie by Stuart. Virginal John Buford, a cavalry commander, rides in and informs McDowell of Longstreet's arrival. McDowell doesn't send this report to Pope for some reason. There's a lot of confusion going on right now. It's around 2 in the afternoon. But let's break it down. Pope doesn't know where Longstreet is and thinks he's miles away. And that Porter and McDowell are about to crash into Jackson's right flank. Porter and McDowell think that the army is withdrawing and that any battle is disadvantageous and that Pope knows about the newly arrived enemy. Confederates don't have that confusion, though. Full General Robert E. Lee and his two subordinates, Major General James Longstreet and Major General Thomas J. Jackson, are in position and ready to attack. Longstreet disagrees, actually, and tells Lee that he sees two formidable divisions. Once he reports of Porter McDowell, Lee calls off the planned assault. Pope thinks Porter and McDowell are just minutes away, and orders attacks against Jackson's line. It's 3 p.m. Bergeron Cuvier Grover takes his brigade to assault A.P. Hill as part of the line, supported by Bergeron Isaac Stevenson's brigade. <laughs> and supposedly Major General Kearney's division. He goes charging into the force and comes into contact with an unknowing brigade of Georgians. after taking a volley at Debbie Range, are given the bayonet. Brigade of South and North Carolinians are sent in and force Grover back. The North Carolinians pursue, but are pounded by Union guns. Major General Joseph Hooker sends in the 3rd Brigade led by Bird General Joseph Carr, just west of Grover, against the veteran Tremble Brigade. Carr does well, wounding Brigadier General Isaac Tremble. With the Excelsior Brigade is apart, a brigade under Colonel Nagley charges Tremble's confused men and sends them to the retreat. But he is counterattacked and forced back by Hood's division, who also breaks Virgin and Robert H. Milroy's men. You have a giant gap in their line, and Pope has to order Schneck's division to plug the hole, exposing his left flank to Longstreet. A tempting target. A Again, the Union has attached without any gains, 
Pope orders Reynolds to attack. Reynolds moves out and sees Longstreet's men. He calls off the assault and reports to Pope. Pope doesn't believe it's Longstreet. It must be Porter McDowell. Assault! If Reynolds won't do it, then Reno will. Reno sends out Nagley again, who attacks Trumbull again, who breaks again, causing the Confederates to counterattack again, forcing Nagley back again, who is then pursued again, and where the Union artillery stops the counterattack again. By now, it's around 4.30, and Pope is beginning to grow impatient and sends word to Porter again. Major General Porter, your line of march brings you in on the enemy's right flank. I desire you to push forward into action and at once on the enemy's flank, and, if possible, on his rear, keeping your right in communication with General Reynolds. The enemy is massed in the woods in front of us, but can be shelled out as soon as you engage their flanks. Keep heavy reserves and use your batteries, keeping well close to your right all the time. In case you are obliged to fall back, do so to your right and rear, so as to keep you in close communication with the right wing. John Pope, Major General, commanding. Fortunately for Pope, his courier gets lost for about two hours. In those two hours, things change. At five, believing Porter's attack to be imminent, he has Major General Kearney attack Jackson's left wing. Kearney charges against the Brigade of Burgeon Maxi Gregg, who is out of ammunition, out of leaders, and out of energy. That's a charge against the equally desperate brigade of Colonel Edward Thomas. Reno sees the opportunity and sends out Colonel Daniel Leisure with a brigade who decimates a brigade of Tennessee infantry. <laughs> Hill sends word to Jackson, who commits his reserves and pushes back in an assault. It's nearing nightfall and McDowell begins to march his forces to Pope's headquarters. Lee receives words of this and asks for the assault he had previously wanted. Longstreet cautions him about the urgent nightfall, and Lee once again listens. Hood is sent out with his division for a reconnaissance about a possible assault tomorrow. Once McDowell arrives, Pope tells him to merely send out Burr General Rufus King. McDowell informs him of King's illness and that Burr General John P. Hatch has taken over command. Pope and Hatch hate each other. Pope orders Hatch to carry on Kearney's assault. Hatch counters about the urgent nightfall and how clogged the roads are. Then word arrives to Pope. Bird General John Bell Hood's division is moving against Bird General John F. Reynolds. Pope orders Hatch to support Reynolds. Hatch counters. His men are tired. They fought the entire battle yesterday and marched today. Pope restates the order and Hatch bitterly marches to Reynolds' aid. Hood pushes both Hatch and Reynolds from Shin Ridge to Bald Hill. Hood then withdraws? Pope thinks he's figured it out. The enemy are retreating! It is at this moment, Major General Irving McDowell informs Major General John Pope that Longstreet is here in force. Pope still believes the enemy are retreating. Longstreet is just here to cover the withdrawal. He orders Porter to get in line and prepares for the assaults of tomorrow. Pope doesn't even move to get the 25,000 men of McClellan nearby. He sends word to Halleck. He has engaged the enemy suffered anywhere from 7,000 to 8,000 casualties. But the enemy's numbers must be much higher than even the 8,000 estimate, probably 14,000. At the Confederate camp, things are different. They have not suffered 14,000 casualties. They suffered much lower casualties than the Union. But their officer corps has taken a beating. Two divisional commanders wounded on the 28th, and today, three brigade commanders were wounded. So far, only one Union brigade commander has been wounded. But that doesn't matter. They now outnumber Pope. He has called off multiple planned assaults today. Tomorrow will be the final day of battle. Both sides have taken setbacks. Both sides have taken hits. Both commanders plan to assault on the 30th. And over a year since the first battles of the war, since the attack on Fort Sumter, this war is nearing a crescendo. Because everyone knows that the war will be decided on the fields nursed by Bull Run. Hello, it's the entire Civil War Week by Week team here, and I'm pleased to announce I have created a Patreon. I would like to thank Kevin Mack, who has already joined it. It means the world to me. I'm not saying that you should join. This entire production will go on without. It's just if you have the money, and only if you have the money, and you would like to give it to me, I would gladly accept it and forever be in your debt.
Now for the normal things. If you liked the video, please like it. If you want to tell me how much you liked it, please comment. If you want to check out what has happened last week, you should be seeing that around now. If you really want to understand the war, you should be seeing a playlist about it right now. Thank you all, and I shall see you next week.